how do you deal with the counterbalance that we haven't had an opportunity to build relationship with parties, uh, with some council, of course, we're familiar with them and you know you have a prior relationship, but how do we deal with that negative uh, or that uh, constraint? And uh, related to that, the fact that we're not able to see people's body language, uh, which is also a key part of communication. So those are my questions for you. I just want okay. the value point. And I think that's lesson number four for me, Greg, which is, I, 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 that was the point that this can be extraordinarily intimate and candid. Um, I, I think it, it is possible to build relationships online. Um, I think when we even, today illustrates that, at least and this is a, it's a short period of time, um, I think by having initial meetings, meetings prior to the main mediation event, just getting to know and just talking with the clients, you can build a relationship with them. I think by being yourself, that's lesson number 10. Um, you can do so. So I, that's one of the most surprising things for me, Greg, is I think it is possible to build that relationship. You need to spend time. You need to engage with people in the way that you would physically ask them about themselves, what they're doing. The Lancaster bomber uh, example was a way of building relationship. So I think you just need to think about what it is that you would normally do and try to apply that, perhaps even uh, a, a bit more than that you might normally do and create the time. Uh, so far as body language is concerned, I mean, that is interesting. Uh, initially, people were concerned about this. Um, uh, and of course, we are missing some aspects of, of body language, inevitably. And that's one of the downsides. We're, we're, we're missing uh, that uh, rapport building. We're, we're missing personal touch, physical touch. On the other hand, I can see all of you. And I can detect from my observation of you, at least in one dimension, maybe two dimensions, what you're thinking, how you're feeling, and what your reaction is. Now, it's different, but I think that we can pick up many signals, and actually, we may pick up more signals because we are tuned more visually now than we would normally be. So I'm, I'm interested and intrigued. There's a lot of good research now coming out about this, um, and um, I, I think, I think one, one has to be um, hopeful, not naive, but accepting of the fact that it's different, but we are able to pick up many signals this way. But that does mean, Greg, working really hard at the signaling. And if necessary, for example, moving away from this, I've got a gallery here of what, fifth, one, two, three, four, five, 15, seven, 20 people, whatever. Uh, so I may need, Greg, for you and I now to go into a private breakout room and have a 20 minute chat and, and, and really get to know each other. And we'll have the opportunity there to to, vis to see each other and and hear each other, so it's 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 not the same. But I think there's a lot there that you will you'll be able to utilize. John, you know, um, connected to Greg, the point Greg is the value right of of this kind of online mediation. Much of what you had to say was was the aspect of the distance right from Scotland coming down to London, staying in hotels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The whole psyche of wanting to accept online mediation has to do with subverting the inconveniences of, of travel and the costs, etc. But in Singapore, we are so small and we are so interconnected that you know you go for a morning run and you fall into the sea, you know. So there's no travel time, nothing at all. Yep. So the whole psyche of wanting to be together and to do it, do you think that works against online mitigation uh, uh, mediation? So if one was making a choice, Imran, between conducting a mediation online or moving next door and all the parties were physically present and could, could reach next door, let's say, in five or ten minutes. I, it's very, very interesting, actually. I think it would be obvious that we should meet. I think because of the need for human connection, it would be obvious to do that. But momentarily, I am being thoughtful about that because this has been such a rich experience. Um, I, I, I do think that we, we will probably go back to and should go back to physically meeting. So if you were able to meet physically in Singapore with minimum inconvenience um, uh, and, and with relative ease, therefore, then that must be a good thing. But do remember that one of the points I made is that people coming to a strange office uh, at a time of real stress for them can feel really uncomfortable and that can add to their stress and therefore make their performance suboptimal. So there may still be a value 
in people being able to conduct the mediation from the safety and space of their own homes. So that's, I think, why I'm just I'm just interested in how this might work out. But what that means, Imran, is that maybe we need to be even more thoughtful about the personal comfort and feeling of psychological safety that we provide for people in an office environment or in a hotel environment or whatever you choose or wherever you choose to conduct mediations. Given what you're I, saying, that, sorry, given what you're saying, maybe there's, there will be a hybrid developing mm -hmm. where even if you can hold a physical mediation, you may still have an online mediation, the preliminary meetings, the getting to know you sessions, and then you, sorry, elevate yourself to the more difficult parts of the mediation and meet physically. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking of or, or, or I mean, it could be the converse, that you meet the parties over a cup of coffee initially, get to know them, build, as Greg was saying, build the rapport, and then you're quite comfortable then conducting the more complicated, with many players, part of the mediation uh, using an online facility. But I think the point about meeting, Greg made this point about knowing the lawyers perhaps, meeting somebody physically is a, is a good thing for building rapport. And once you have done that, it is easier then perhaps to, uh, to engage with them online. So you're right, Emran, I think hybrid, um, I think flexibility is a key. Uh, and, and there's no binary answer to this. And we should, as mediators, we should avoid seeking binary answers. My last point, I think, was take it case by case and be thoughtful. What would you say, given your experience, would be the factors you would, 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 would take into account as to choosing to go online? You think online is actually better in this case? Uh, or, or the converse might be, in, in certain cases, the physical might be better. What would be the, the key factors that you think would, would play to that? So let me be a mediator now, Stephen, and let's brainstorm, if I may use that word. Let's, around the room, let's ask ourselves, what are the factors that come into play if you have a multi-party uh, international mediation or a mediation in which people have to travel uh, for more than just a, a short distance? What factors come into play in the decision for this to be online or physically present? So rather than me answering Stephen's question, let's, let's, just, let's just get six or seven factors. Let's just do a quick brainstorm together. Yeah, um, one, one of the factors that, that um, on, on this point, um, and to Imran's point, even if we can meet um, in person, what I found really interesting, and, and, and I suppose it, um, uh, it aligns with what, uh, John, you were saying about the Anglo-American mediators, uh, recent consensus. After trying virtual mediation, I think even if we were in Singapore, I would highly encourage um, thought about whether we do hybrid sessions. Um, so with lay um, uh, disputants, safety and the sense of safety and being in a familiar place is important. But then when we're dealing with lawyers and professional advisors and very technical disputes, um, it's also very useful to have them in their offices having access to all the information that they may need when there's a need to share this information. When we tend, when we meet in person, we tend not to bring, you know, cut all our materials with us. Of course, you could bring, you bring laptops and, and so on. Um, but what I did find was that um, when people are in their own offices, they're more attuned to, okay, I can share this information. We have this uh, document exchange protocol. Um, it, it's something that, that's pretty, uh, I, I found we saved a lot of time. People were more willing to exchange uh, documents that way. Okay, so there are at least two factors there. Uh, and, and, and principle amongst them is ease of use of materials. Um, and ease of access to the facilities that even the lawyers might need in a mediation process, in addition to the psychological safety that the clients may feel. So there, there's a couple of factors. What else, folks? Um, I, I just wanted to, to ask whether you've come across uh, instances where there are actually translation uh, involved. Again, you know, I think really just follow on from what Greg said about, you know, the interaction uh, not being physically present in one room. You know, how, how, whether you have any experience dealing with that, especially with uh, simultaneous translation, um, you, know, you know, between witnesses uh, in, the, in the online medium. I, I, I work only in one language and that's English. So I, so I don't have that experience even in the normal face-to-face -face setting. Uh, and so I can't really contrast and compare uh, off the top of my head. I'm not sure how much different it would be. It might even be easier, but I don't know. What about others? Other, other thoughts? Actually, with JIMC, uh, during the, uh, our joint COVID-19 
And what was interesting is in the bottom of this, you see the list of uh, icons here, right? Participants, chats, share screen, record, re re uh, reaction. They had an yep. additional one called translation. And I think that's part of the Zoom service. You could click that, and then there are two languages, English and Japanese, and the translation was done simultaneously. So I was very impressed by that uh, webinar we held with the Japanese, uh, our Japanese counterpart, JIMC, where, again, as I speak, they are listening to it in Japanese. And when I... Yep. You know, when, 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 when they speak in Japanese, I hear it in English. Of course, we can't verify the accuracy of the translation because it's done um, simultaneously, but the, the quality of it, it was seamless and, and I, I thought it worked really well. So something to bear in mind. Can I just make a point about online and physical space? I think the difficulty could arise if you have an asymmetry. So I, was, I think I was asked recently about conducting the mediation where I might be physically present with one party and another party might be online or vice versa. I might be online, but others might be physically present. I think we've got to be very careful lest there's any impression of a loss of uh, confidence and trust in the mediator and the mediation process simply because of physical proximity and people not being aware of what the mediator is doing. Now that may be capable of being overridden by the mediator's approach to the process but I think in talking about hybrids we need to be again very thoughtful about mixing up uh, mediums. John if I can just share an anecdote on that last point of asymmetry I think that's also a consideration on why uh, some parties may choose online uh, because one of the mediations I did this year uh, under the auspices of SIMC had a party that was uh, resident uh, locally and uh, another party that was resident overseas so for symmetry and uh, parity you know we did it online. Yeah, so that's that parity is a great word. I like parity is super, but far better than equality. Parity, absolutely. Thanks, Greg. To come back to Imran's point, um, I think Imran, if if the parties can can meet physically without a problem, I, that's my preference as well because I think you can try and connect better. But the reality is is changing. Okay, that's what we found, and particularly with international disputes, you you would have one party who's abroad. And I think the preference is even if, if the vaccine is found, people will want to mediate online as well. That's what we are we are anticipating. And as a center, we are we want to have options. Um, so I think that's why it's important for all of us, if, if you are going to mediate, to learn how to use technology well. Um, and, and there are many points, John has, has pointed out many different skills we can use. I think for those of you who, who mediated with me, and this is your to your point of building relationships. Uh, I don't start a joint session straight away. Uh, before a mediation, I, I would do a private session with each party. Uh, even physically, I do that. But online, I think it's even more important to do that private session, to spend a bit more time with that party, to just to build that rapport and build that relationship. Uh, and one of the techniques I've found, which I would like to share with you all, is, is I, I found that, you know, if I'm doing a private session, I would get the lawyer, let's say the lawyer, because in Singapore, we do a lot of hybrid processes, right? If the lawyer is here, the lawyers are in Singapore, and the clients are abroad. If I do a private session, I would get the lawyer to introduce me, you know, um, in that private session first. And then I would try and sit uh, alongside the lawyer with social distancing, of course. Uh, but if you can see the two of us sitting there together, um, you know, for the client to see his lawyer and then see the mediator there, he doesn't feel that the media is, is outside of the box. Um, and, and I think that's one way to try and build that rapport. I think there are a multiplicity of factors, many of which we've been discussing, to take into account when making the choice that you were asking about. Uh, well, yeah, thank you, John. I think it, it's something that, that really interesting is I, I kind of see this as well in the arbitration context where we are moving to online arbitration. I think there's going to be, or using the virtual medium, I think there's a uh, uh, certainly a use for that you know, post-pandemic restrictions. And I was very interested to hear that, that you're finding the same experience in the mediation context. And you know, I think what particularly sort of intrigues me would be, you know, when you have that choice, you know, you would obviously weigh, I think, the advantages and disadvantages to each uh, medium. Yeah. And the yeah. question is, for this particular case, you know, do the advantages outweigh the disadvantages and in which direction? That, that was... Yeah. That. 
thing that I as a mediator, you would you would you would you would hopefully in a complex matter you would you would generate options. You would develop criteria by which to assess the options. You would rank your options, perhaps prioritize them. You would do a bit of a batna and a watna uh, check, benchmark. All of that could apply to this discussion about the appropriate. Uh, technology and means to use to mediate. So I think I think bringing a sense of discipline to it and, and structure framework. Um, again, it's incumbent upon us as mediators, Stephen, to do that because that's that's what we offer. But but not having a fixed solution no, and not telling the parties. Uh, you know, as a corollary to Stephen's question, and if I could also direct this to George, who is the godfather of family mediation in Singapore. <laughs> I mean, I do see the characteristics of commercial mediation and family mediation to be two different animals, creatures, right? And their merits on online as well as physical. As a general approach, would you think that if there is the possibility that one should always opt for a physical mediation where family matters are concerned? That personal, that personal touch, right? And George, if you could also give your view because a lot of us are going to be looking to you to see what we do in the future. So is that a question for me, George? You go ahead first, John, and then I'll, I'll, I'll... So he doesn't want to answer, he wants to hear your answer first. <laughs> that, that's, because, I can that's, answer. Because I, that's because I challenged him last time around. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't do family mediation as such, but I do a lot of mediation involving family members, uh, usually in a business context, very often agricultural, in fact, every one of them this week, I think. Um, so um, actually, I think it's been sometimes it's been easier to do it online uh, because they're not in the same physical space, which creates tension and stress. Um, so again, I think it depends upon the circumstances, Imran, but I wouldn't be able to speak about a mediation was just purely about family relationships, perhaps divorce, separation, uh, looking after children. So I, I would I would not offer a view, but George will give you a view on that. <laughs> would, okay. Were you George? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so Imran, I, I know you do a lot of family work and, and we have done mediations together. Uh, for me, and this is personal, is a personal view, I, I, I would prefer it to be face-to-face. Because, they, they are, like John says, there are a lot of emotions in, involved. And sometimes it involves um, crying. Um, and and I, will, I, I welcome that. I mean, I tell people that at a family, if you need to express your, your, your feelings, do so. And if you need the other part, party to know that you're in this state, please, you know, for me, it's, it's conveying your, your, your feelings, your emotions, your, your views. So that, I think... I'm still a bit old school in, in, in this sense. If we can do it physically, I would prefer that. But if we can't, and, and John's absolutely right, we, we should skill, our, skill up our skills, uh, move up our skills, um, learn how to manage that on screen. Yeah. And maybe, and think, maybe it requires more time. Yeah. There is one ingredient here, which I think reinforces George's point. Recent research suggests that personal touch is really important. That's the one thing we cannot do. I can't stretch out my finger yet, although it's coming apparently, and so that you can feel this. So if somebody is crying, it may just be important that the mediator is physically present and even just a gentle um, hand on a shoulder or on the upper arm, which might still be okay in, in these very sensitive times, that sense of physical reassurance may be really, really important in the situation that George describes. So for all of our um, enthusiasm and my enthusiasm for this online medium, what we, what we mustn't forget is the value and, and perhaps necessity for some people of a form of physical touch. Now, it may be that that can be substituted by having a partner available who is able to, in a sense, substitute for the mediator, maybe some careful choreographer, choreography there. But, but I think that is something to, to think about. And that would be a reason, therefore, in any situation for considering physical proximity. I mean, even offering a tissue box, you know, to the party, that's, that's one way to show you empathize. Um, but you know the answers, Imran. You've done so many of these yourself. <laughs> yeah, what do you think? I'm curious to see whether you mention the fact that you're usually very charming as a formula of your success. 
<laughs> Imran, Imran, seriously, what is your answer to your question? <laughs> no, I think I think you know this 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 the way George has put it as um, even offering a tissue box, right? I think whether you're being a mediator on a family matter is not much different as being a lawyer to a client who comes in on a family matter. You're going to have to offer that tissue box even as a lawyer, not just as a mediator. Because in a family matter, you have to be all things to all men if you're going to serve the, the needs of that client, you know? Uh, and all and women as well. So, sorry? And all women. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think uh, a physical that physical touch, that physical presence, um, the, the concern, um, it, it's much easier to exude all that if you have a physical connection or a physical environment. You know? so let me make one further point, and that is that there is a danger in um, isolating family cases as if they were uniquely different from others. In my experience, many commercial cases also are high emotion. In fact, I think all cases have emotion within them. What techniques would you do when you have legal team and client being very, you know, exhibiting a high degree of animosity towards each other? I think that just by virtue of doing it this way, it seems to have a psychological impact. But I think it's the same old uh, uh, idea as, as in a physical face-to-face. Uh, -face. You set down your ground rules, you set out your protocols, your expectations of behavior. And then as mediator, it's your responsibility so far as you can to manage the process and manage people's behavior. And of course you can, uh, I suppose, you can bring a session to a conclusion very quickly, that there would be no physical movement as you close off a, a plenary room and move people back to their private spaces. Here you can do it in an instant. You can explain to them what you're doing and why. So there may be advantages actually in, in this, both in, in, in people's internal management of themselves and in your ability as a mediator to manage both protocols and the technology to reduce the, the risk of there being inflammation or, or aggression. I think it goes back to John's lesson number two. This is actually mediation using an online process. Is that number two or three, John? Number two. <laughs> number two, yeah. right. Okay, so if we try and remember that fundamentally, and if, if we are, even if you're in a face-to-face -face situation, when people are aggressive, I would remind myself, go back to the interests of the parties. Remind them of their interests. Why are they at a mediation? So how do we do that online? Um, same techniques. If the lawyers are the problem, you, from your perspective, if that's at the moment that that's the problem, I would speak with the lawyers privately first. It could be separately, a lawyer to lawyer, um, openly. We might try and help them remind themselves of, of, the, of the interests of the parties and they may open up to you. Um, if you can get a chance um, to speak to the parties, again, remind them of, of their interests, the advantages, Batner, Wetner. So go back to basics, but it's, it's just using uh, technology as, as a medium.